reason of you at home to give God some praise because it's his grace, it's his mercy, it's his unending love that flows through our family, that flows through our lives, that no matter what we're going through, we know that he's in it with us. No matter what we encounter, we know he's right beside us. No matter what the enemy would want to bring your way, God will raise up a standard against him. He will send angels toward concerning you because of his love, because of his grace, because of his word. Oh, I don't know no better reason to give God glory. Can you give God some praise this evening? You at home that are streaming, can you give God some praise? Because you're not spectators, you're participators. Oh, you're right here with us in spirit. God sees you, he's right there with you. Can you praise God with us this evening? I am just so grateful for God. You can have your seats this evening. If you are a student in the building, we're going to go ahead and release you to class. If you are a student, you can head back to class. And I want you to look at somebody next to you and encourage them. And I want you to tell them, stay on course. Look at the other person and say, stay on course. You at home, tell yourself, stay on course. Stay on course, amen. I just want to thank God for my salvation. We don't take it lightly, the opportunity and the blessing it is to come and share the word of God with you. Amen. And all of you look real good tonight. Come on now. We call you Bible, Bible scholars. We call you watching online Bible scholars because you guys make your way out to Bible study, which means you guys are hungry for the word of God. Amen. And our prayer is that you continue to grow in the word of God. So I just want to thank my pastors. I want to thank my husband, which this year will make 28 years of marriage. I'm like, come on, God. Come on, Jesus. And God gets, God gets all the glory. God gets all the glory because, uh, yeah, he just gets all the glory. So let me do a plug for LOP real quick. If you haven't signed up for Love on Purpose to be intentional about your marriage, I would suggest you jump on board. Don't wait till the last minute because you can never stop growing in your marriage, in your relationships, in the things of God. Amen. We want to let you know on behalf of your pastors, we love you. We appreciate you. And most of all, we thank God for you. Look at somebody and say, are you serving somewhere? Here comes another plug, y'all, I'm just, I'm just flowing. We're having a central workers meeting this Saturday, this Saturday at 9 a.m. If you're not serving somewhere, come out and hear what, the, hear what they have to say. It's a lot of fun. You build community, and who knows what God may do. So I would say come out this Saturday at 9 a.m., amen? Do we have any first-time visitors that are visiting us tonight, whether you are online or in the house? Any first-time visitors? Well, welcome back. Praise the Lord. If it's your first time watching online, thank you. Welcome back if it is not. Let's go ahead and begin with the vision. Amen? You guys are ready for the vision? To equip people with the knowledge of God's word, to empower people to seek God's face, daily prayer, to encounter and be filled with the Holy Spirit, to evangelize our community, our county, our community, our country, and our world. I'm going I'm to get it. I'm going to get it. Community, our country, and our world talk about global evangelism. Amen. To embrace every person in godly love, for God is love for each one to reach one. Remember to encourage someone, if you can, on a daily basis. Let's make our faith confession. You know, you know why we make our faith confession? Because the Bible tells us, I believe it's in the book of Timothy. Don't quote me on it. But it says to stir yourselves up in the gifts that God has given you. So this serves as a reminder to us. So whatever you have, whether it's a electronic device, an actual Bible, your phone, let's make our faith, faith confession. 
And don't forget you at home, participate. This is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I believe that my life will never be the same after hearing and doing the living Word of God in Jesus' name. After hearing and doing. It seems like every time I get up here, I expose a little bit more of myself. And sometimes I struggle with God, God, I don't want to say that. Do I have to say that? Should I say that? Or I shouldn't probably say that. And he's like, yeah, you better go on and say that. And so as we've been wa walking through the book of Samuel, we've kind of been seeing the disobedience of Saul kind of creep in, right? So I didn't want to be disobedient. So if you don't know me, I am very directionally challenged. If you don't know what that means, that means I could walk into a mall and get turned around and not know which way I came in and then can't find my car. But if you know my husband, my husband served in the Navy for a number of years. And you can drop this man anywhere in the world. And in about five to ten minutes, he will have his directional situation calibrated. He will know where is north, south, east, and west, having never been in the city. I don't know. I thought it was just a man thing because, see, I, I have to leverage my resources. When I'm weak in this area, I need to be strengthened over here, so I have to leverage my resources. So I'll say, hey, Alexa, can you get me to 12847 Bomb Riverview Road? Or I'll say, hey, Siri, can you get me to 10305 U.S. Highway 41? So I've learned how to leverage my resources. But this man is very directional. And, and I know Chief, he gets tired of me because every time they do something in the church, and I've been at the church eight years, y'all, eight years. And every weekend, I have to ask Chief, Chief, which is the south door and which is the north door? I kid you not, because when I'm here, somebody's at the south door. I run to the wrong door. So I just learned at my age, Listen, we are going to levy technology because if I don't, I will get off course. And if I get off course, I'll end up somewhere I don't want to be. And even the smallest degree can get us off course. And that's what slowly happened to King Saul. King Saul. The prophet Samuel had completed what Saul should have done, which was putting King Agag to death. We're going to pick it up in chapter 16 because we find Samuel is in a place of mourning. He's mourning because the Lord gave a harsh answer. And you have to remember, Samuel reared Saul. He kind of poured into him. Not kind of, he did. He led him. He groomed him. So in kind of a way, Saul was like Samuel's mentee, right? And so for the Lord to say, I have regretted that I made Saul king, grieved Samuel. It hurt his heart. A lot of times when we see someone get off of course, for whatever reason that may be, the first question we tend to ask ourselves is, what happened? Or why? What went wrong? And in Saul's case, it was peer pressure from his troops that led to his disobedience. How many have ever experienced peer pressure? Peer pressure will take you places you don't want to go. Peer pressure will cause you to fit in. And it happens amongst adults. You know, when I was in school, just like I thought when I got 18, I wouldn't have acne anymore, that did not happen. And I thought when I got out of high school, people didn't gossip no more. When I got in college and adult, that didn't happen. And so peer pressure still happens even amongst adults. And Saul said, and it said it in chapter 15, verse 20, 24. He says, but I was afraid of the men, and I gave in to them. And when he says, I gave in to them, Samuel has to deliver a devastating word from the Lord. He tells him, he says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has now rejected you as king. 
He has now rejected you. The man that God put on the throne was the same man God was about to dethrone. See, I have phobo. Phobo, fear of being obsolete. So I'm always, God, whatever you want this chick to do, I'm going to do it. As long as you make it plain, as long as you make it loud and clear, I got you, God. I will do it. No matter what anybody else may think or say. There is a purpose and a plan when we walk in obedience. Look at someone and say, stay the course. Look at someone else and encourage them and say, stay the course. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you for the power of your word, the validity of your word. And this evening, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would tug on the strings of our heart, that we would be provoked to walk in obedience daily according to your word, according to your will, according to your plan. I pray for every heart, every mind, everyone who is watching in the sound of my voice. Spirit of the living God, have your way in their lives. Help us to understand the significance of obedience and the impact of disobedience. God, have your way in our lives, and we'll be so careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Amen. Amen. Tell yourself to stay the course. Nothing good can come from getting off course except setbacks. Except setbacks. I don't have time for setbacks. Let's pick it up in verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. God is funny because as I read the scripture, sometimes the animation just jumps out at you. So when Saul is mourning, the Lord allowed him to mourn for a moment. But then he says, how long will you mourn? It's like he told Samuel or popped him upside the head and said, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. We used to have a saying when I was growing up between me and my friends because when we'd have a bad day or when we were, you know, had a bad thing, we would tell each other, oh, cry a river, build a bridge, and get over it. Cry a river, build a bridge, and get over it. So as the Lord is telling Samuel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. He says, for I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. It's a good thing to be chosen. You have to know that you are chosen tonight. You may not think it. You may not feel like it. But you got to know that you are made in the image of Christ and you are chosen. Samuel was chosen. Saul was chosen. And now David is about to be chosen. The thing about being chosen is when we're chosen by God, we must do all we can to walk in obedience to the word of God and to his will. You see, we are all at different stages in our walk with Christ. And as you read, as you study, as you learn, as you grow, conviction sets in at different points and places in your life. As you grow, what you used to do, you can't do anymore. And as you mature, then you can't do that anymore. And I remember the Lord used to hit me upside my head with this scripture. And I'm going to share it with you. So I did a mashup of translations. So it says in James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doth not, to him it is sin. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. Remember this, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not do it. And then anyone then who knows the right thing to do yet fails to do the right thing is guilty of sin. So everybody's conviction is different according to where they're at. But you'll know like you know when God is calling you to be obedient to his word and to the things of God. Amen. He goes on to says, he says, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he's going to kill me. And then the Lord said, as if just to walk over his concern, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. God didn't even respond to Samuel's concern, but he's going to kill me. Do you think that's a concern? That's a concern, right? You need to know great men 
Even great men in the Bible and great men today will encounter fear. It's what you do in the face of fear. You see, Saul in fear gave in to peer pressure and what the people said therefore led to his disobedience. We're going to see that Samuel, even though he had fear, is still going to obey the Lord. So the next time that you have fear, what are you going to do? Are you going to retreat? Or are you going to go head to head and face the fear and see the breakthrough that God has for your life? Even great men have fear. And God is so funny. He don't even address Samuel. As if to say, Samuel, I've been with you all these years. Haven't I taken care of you? Haven't I done everything for you since you were a little boy? Why now do you fear man? So God didn't even address it. I was like, okay. He didn't even address it. He tells him, he says, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Samuel did. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. He says, invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. I like when he says, invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. Oftentimes, God won't give you the rest of the plan until you show up. Tell somebody show up. That's all you got. Don't you ever wonder why you struggle when it's time to come to get to church or it's time to do something you know you need to for God? You break out in an argument with somebody. You get mad. I ain't going. You have a fit. I'm telling you, because there's always opposition. And you got to know if you can get past that opposition, God's got something for you when you, when you, when you show up. That's all you got to do. You could just get to the house of God. Verse 4, Samuel said, Samuel did what the Lord said. He moved in obedience. Somebody say obedience. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? You see, Saul's name was great throughout the land. They knew if he said something, it was 100% accurate. So if a man shows up at your doorstep and you know like you know like you know, you'd be asking the saint, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. The elders were afraid because they knew of the split between Samuel and Saul. So it was kind of like one of those things where, you know, there's this major political breakup and the whole world knows about it. And they did not want repercussions. Samuel performed the purification rite for Jesse and his sons to prepare them to come before God in worship and to offer a sacrifice. That word consecrate means the devoting or setting apart of anything for the worship or service of God. It is preparation to meet with God. It's preparation of mind, preparation of heart. By cleansing ourselves from unrighteousness, by bowing in humility in a position of repentance and asking for forgiveness. Did you know our 21-day fast is a time of consecration? Did you know that at the end of the 21-day fast, God is moving throughout, enduring, and even at the end, because we are separating ourselves unto the Lord. Verse 6 says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. How do you see somebody's heart? 
because we do a lot with the outer, right? You know, I was telling somebody, you know, the Bible says in the last days people will be lovers of themselves, right? Lovers of pleasure rather than of good. And, you know, we have our social media and our selfies and putting ourselves out there and all that kind of stuff. How do you see a person's heart? That's what you have to pray. God, let me see their heart. Let me see what you see. And you pray for that person's heart. Saul was tall and handsome, an impressive looking man. And they go through great lengths to tell us what Saul looked like and what David looked like. Samuel may have been trying to find someone who looked like Saul to be Israel's next king, but God warned him against judging by appearance. When people judge by outward appearance, they may overlook quality individuals who lack the particular physical qualities society currently admires. But appearance doesn't reveal what people are really like or what their true value or nature is. Fortunately, God judges by faith and character, not appearance. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And because only God can see what's on the inside, only he can accurately judge people. A lot of people spend a lot of hours each week, each week maintaining their outward appearance. They should do even more to develop their inner character. That's good, right? While everyone can see your face, only you and God know what your heart really looks like. Question for you. What steps are you taking to improve the, the attractiveness of your heart in the Lord's eyes? What steps are you taking to improve your attractiveness in the eyes of the Lord? What does he delight in? What does he love? He loves a humble heart and a contrite spirit. What else does he love? To do good to others, to reach souls. Verse 8 says, Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord, mm, not this one either. Then Jesse had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, mm, not this one either. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So we asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? Ah, Jesse says, but yet there is still the youngest. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, sit for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and brought him in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. At this time, David was about 15, maybe 16 years old. So he's about high school. He's high school. And the Lord says, this is the one. Rise and anoint him. At this stage, the Lord is about to appoint a new king under the radar. See, sometimes you don't know it, but you're under the radar for a set and appointed time. And you never know it because there is a season of preparation and a season of serving under the radar. The position that I'm in today at my job, I didn't start there. I came in under a different position, didn't know why I was there, and I told the Lord, if you don't clarify that I'm supposed to be here, I am not staying. And he gave me a sign, and I was there under the radar, not realizing that one day the one who was in power would no longer be, and he would need help because God works under the radar. Do not discount humble beginnings. Do not discount when it's time to serve. So Samuel, in verse 13, took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord, somebody say the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Then Samuel went to Ramah. David was anointed king, but it was done in secret. He was not publicly anointed until much later. Saul was still legally king, but God was preparing David for his future responsibilities. 
The anointing oil poured over David's head stood for holiness. It was used to set people or objects apart for God's service. Each king and high priest of Israel was anointed with oil. This commissioned them as God's representative to the nation. And although God rejected Saul's kingship by not allowing any of his descendants to sit on the throne, it began with Saul and it would end with him. Normally, it is a succession. Your son sits on the throne, your son's son. But because of his disobedience, he wiped it out for his lineage. Verse 14 says, Now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. What was this tormenting spirit? Why did the Lord send it? Perhaps Saul was deeply depressed, or perhaps when the Holy Spirit left Saul, God allowed an evil spirit or a demon to torment him as judgment for his disobedience. This would demonstrate God's power over the spirit world. Either way, Saul was driven to madness and paranoia, which led him to attempt to murder David. Saul's attendant in verse 15, Saul's attendant said to him, see, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre, a.k.a. harp. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. Look at this. Saul's own people told him. Saul's attendant, see, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Don't discount those whom God has placed around you, near you, or in your lives. Because God can use them just as much, if not more so. His attendants knew that that spirit came from God. And they were like, oh, we know someone who can help you. Verse 710 says, so Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring them to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well, and he's a good-looking kid. And the Lord is with him. That's what matters. He said, and the Lord is with him. You got to know today that the Lord is with you. And if the Lord is on your side and the Lord is for you, who? Yes. Who can be against you? Then Saul, verse 19, sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey, loaded it with bread, a skin of wine, a young goat, and sent them with David, sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, so much so that David became one of his armor bearers. Don't despise humble beginnings. It is our duty, yours and mine, to serve. It is in our service that God begins to mold, shape, and deal with our characters, deal with our attitudes, deal with who we are so we can grow to a better place. The Bible tells us, and Jesus is our example in Matthew 20, 28, he says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You see, the plan was already underway when God secretly had Samuel anoint, king, anoint David as king. Now God had to position David so David could grow up and learn and see how to build a kingdom, learn how to master an army. Don't discount those that are over you if God places you under them because you never know when the day may come when it's time for you to rise up. Don't discount when you have to serve someone because when you serve, God is able to elevate. The way up is the way down. Humility, sacrifice, and that is how God gets glory. And so he brings them in. See, the plan was already underway. A plan may not always look the way you think it's going to look, 
But God will put you in places so he can get you ready. Somebody say, get you ready. Yeah, David had to go through some things, dodging some spears and running for his life. But God knew he was up to the task, and he brought him in as a young kid to accomplish his will. You see, God's never going to let his people suffer. God will never let his people suffer. He will always have a ram in a bush. He will always have somebody in waiting. He will always be prepared. You will never catch God off guard. I don't care how mad you get at God. You be like, God, I ain't. God's going to be like, okay. I've seen it happen. He'd be like, okay, you, you stay over there if you want to. And he'll raise up over here. And that's what he does because he don't play with his people. He loves you. He loves you and he's got the best for you. Verse 22 says this. Then Saul sent word to Jesse. Allow David to remain in my service for I am pleased with him. When the king calls, you answer. In those days, it's not like you could say, no, I don't want to go. You know the story of Queen Esther. I mean, the story of, yeah, the book of Esther when Queen Vashti told the king she wasn't coming. She got vanquished. She lost her place. She lost her crown. So when the king calls, you answer. That's how I learned to be with Jesus. When the king calls, I answer. Yes, Lord, your servant is listening. What would you have me to do today, God? Oh, you want me to encourage that person. Pray for you. You got it, God. When the king calls, you answer. Sometimes we really think or we believe we actually got a choice in the matter. And sometimes that's our problem. I'm going to share a quick scenario. And I'm not talking about you. Just a scenario. So our teens, to get them to mesh together, you know, they have to spend time together, right? And so sometimes they, when, when it's new, they, 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 it's hard to get them to come in unless you know them. You have, to, you have to make them keep coming, right? So I always tell the parents, I said, you know, if they tell you they want, don't want to come, you got to make them come. Because what happens is they need that time to gel. They need that time of formation. And I tell them, we make them go to school to get their education. We make them go to their sports to make sure they got that side down. Do we make them come to church to get their spiritual act in check? Because I don't want to go visit a son or a daughter in jail and you didn't bring them. So with that being said, we have to be people who move in obedience. We have to be people that, that, that know that we don't always have a choice in the matter when it comes to the things of God. It is not an option. I don't know why sometimes we think it is. When the king calls, you answer. Don't despise humble beginnings. When Saul asked David to be in his service, he obviously didn't know that David had been secretly anointed king. But Saul's invitation presented an excellent opportunity for the young man and future king to gain firsthand information about leading an army and building a nation. Sometimes our plans, even the ones we think God has approved, have to be put on hold. Sometimes our plans get interrupted, or they don't even develop as quickly as we desire. You ever had a plan, and it just didn't work quite work out the way you thought it was going to work out? I have. But like David, we can use the waiting time profitably. We can choose to learn and grow in our present situation and circumstances, whatever that may be. We're never too old to, to learn, to grow, to build ourselves up. Verse 23 says, whenever the spirit of the Lord, whenever the spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul, and he would feel better. And the evil spirit would leave him. I kind of wonder what that looks like when that evil spirit would came up on Saul. Did it look like bipolar? Did it look like schizophrenia? Did it look like depression? They said he acted like a madman. How does a madman act? I wonder what that looked like. All because Saul got off course. Tell your neighbor, stay on course. 
Because for Saul, by getting off course, altered the rest of his life. Can you put that picture up? I want to share a story with you in closing. This is a one and a half degree angle. One and a half. You know, 90 degree is like this. So that's like 1.5, one and a half degree. On October 31st in 1983, a Korean Airlines flight, and this is a true story, flight 007, departed from Anchorage, Alaska for a direct flight to Seoul, Korea. But unknown to the crew, however, the computer engaging the flight navigation system contained a one and a half degree routing error. At the point of departure, the mistake, it was unnoticeable. 100 miles out, the deviation was still so small as to be undetectable. But as the giant 747 continued across the Aleutian Islands and out over the Pacific, the plane was increasingly straying from its proper course. So the course that it was on, because of that degree of error, not even visible to the eye, to the instrument, to the radar, was taking them in a different direction. The plane increasingly strayed from its proper course. Eventually, it was flying over Soviet airspace. Russian radar picked up the error, and fighter jets scrambled to intercept Flight 007. A short time later, the jet was shot out of the sky over mainland Russia, and the lives of everyone on board was lost, all because of a one-and-a-half-degree routing error. How much damage can disobedience do? The prodigal son found himself in a pig pen because of disobedience. Jonah was disobedient and found himself in the belly of the whale because he didn't do what the Lord told him to do. Val was disobedient and found herself sitting behind bars of L.A. County because she didn't do what the Lord was telling her to do. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If you look back over your life, can you see the areas where disobedience took you off course? Can you see the areas and what kind of damage it did to your life? Can you see the impact and the devastation that disobedience can have, not only for you but for your lineage? Can you see the effects of disobedience? Deuteronomy, Moses told, the Lord told Moses and the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 30, verses 11 through 19, he says, Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you, nor, he says, is it beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who's going to go to heaven and get it for us? Or you have to ask, who's going to get it and proclaim it so we can obey it? He says, nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who's going to cross the sea and go get it for us to proclaim it so we can obey it? No. He said, the word is very near you. It is in you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart so you can obey it. Even two-year-olds know when they've done something wrong. See, I said before you today, life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are to possess. But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away, if you're listening to other people, if you succumb to peer pressure, if you bow down to other gods, and if you worship them and those other things, and you put them before me, he says, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will certainly be cut off. You will not live long in the land, and you will not enter to possess it. And then he says, this day I call heavens, I call the heavens, and the earth as witnesses against you that have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. Choose life. Choose life so that you and your children, so that you and your children, so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast 
for the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are consequences to our disobedience. See, the sin that runs rampant in the world, the sin that runs rampant in the world, the consequences of that is wrapped up in that sin. And we have to learn to be people who follow Christ in obedience. Obedience is the key. Obedience is the main ingredient that we should be working on, that God would be glorified every head bowed and every eye closed. If you don't know the Lord today, I want to give you an opportunity because the Bible tells us in Romans that we all fall short of the glory of God. There are none of us who are perfect and we have to get up and begin again. And it's okay because we have an advocate. His name is Jesus. We have someone as an intermediary who stands before us in the Father to ask and to go between. So if you don't know the Lord this evening, if you're watching online, just say this prayer and repeat it after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose on the third day. I ask that you come into my life, come into my heart, I ask that you would change me, deliver me, heal me, and fill me with your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen. Father, I pray for everyone in the sanctuary. Father, we're asking for another level of obedience. God, we want to continue to be more like you. Your word says that we are made in your image. Your word says that you've given us the power of the Holy Spirit. Your word says that you have created us for works of service. So, Spirit of the living God, we give you permission for conviction in our lives. Spirit of the living God, we give you permission to provoke us to change. Spirit of the living God, we welcome you and we give you permission to have your way that when we want to go left and we need to go right, you would let us know. Spirit of the living God, we give you your rightful place. And God, as we continue to separate ourselves for the next few days in the, coming, in the finishing of our fast, speak to every heart, speak to every mind. Holy Spirit, have your way. Oh, Jesus, we thank you and we give you all the glory, all the honor and all the praise in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? You at home, can you give Jesus a hand clap? That's a sobering word, huh? Yeah, obedience. And we have to begin again in every area, right? All right, amen. All right, we're going to start, start. We're going to take up offering. Yay! It's time for offering. We have several ways to give. So you at home, you're not left out. Several ways to give right there on the screen behind me. Uh, LFCC.tv for says give. You can text. You can cash app. You can zail. If you're in the sanctuary and you want to grab an envelope, you can put in the side boxes if you'd like. Many, many ways to give. Amen. Let's pray for the offering. Father, we thank you for this time of giving. We want to be sowers. We want to be good stewards of what you've given us, Father. We want to, Father, help grow and build the kingdom. I pray for every giver and those who aren't able to give, and that you will multiply those, Father, who are able to give, that they are able to give. Father, we want to experience the joy in giving. So, Lord, be glorified through our giving. We pray, Father, that you just use the finances for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we thank you for the new building, that Father, that's being erected. We ask, Lord, that you just continue to provide all of the resources that's needed, and we're careful to give you glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Amen. All right, we've got a few announcements. All right, so we all know we're no longer on Facebook. We are only streaming on YouTube and our website, lfcc.tv, and our live classes. How many in here, who, let me see your show of hands if you've never taken a live class, real quickly. If you've never taken a live class. All right, you guys are in for a treat. 
So we have live classes throughout the year. The one we have coming up that just started is financial stewardship. I can't see that. That began the 22nd, which was this past Monday. Financial stewardship is a great class. And all the classes are free. You just have to probably pay for a book. Maybe. Yeah, but they're all free. Financial stewardship, divorce care. If you've gone through a divorce, um, this class is for you. We have divorce care for kids. Both of these classes are virtual. Divorce care for kids is not virtual because we like them to be in the sanctuary. So check out our classes. I, I'm an, I, again, a fear of being obsolete. I am a continued learner. I, I continue to take courses and classes because there's always something new I learn. We have our central workers training, as I mentioned earlier. This Saturday, 9 a.m., there'll be refreshments. I'm like, who's whistling? There'll be refreshments. Uh, come on out. Hang out with us. You know, Pastor Ty runs the um, Ascender Worker Training. He be giving us some puzzles that, listen, listen. Yeah, I'm going to have to work on that one. But join us this Saturday. Young Adult First Fridays, amen. I heard that is on fire. If you have a young adult between the ages of 18 and 29, man, you want to bring them out. It's that thing, you know, I don't know nobody. No, bring, come on out. You get to know people. You get to know somebody. If you have any questions about it, Minister David's sitting right there. And our Singles and Relationship panel. We have a lot of announcements. Woo! I used to be single. Not no more. February 16th, 7.30 p.m. If you have any questions, Miss Marilyn is sitting right there. Um, yay, single. So that's going to be awesome, guys. Mark your calendar. And lastly, love on purpose. You want to invest in your marriage. Or even if you're a wife in waiting or a husband in waiting, come on out. You can learn and get ready and just be prepared. Amen. February 23rd through the 24th, single, it's all right there. My mouth is dry. Let's all stand, amen. Thank you so much at home for watching. The Lord bless you. Um, the Lord take care of you. We are going to say our closing and we will be dismissed. There will be ministers at the front, amen. Let's, 1 John 4, 4, thank you all for coming out. Don't forget there's food in the back, ministers in the front. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Shake somebody's hands, love on someone, and enjoy your evening.